Kimberly was a college girl, a sorority sister who partied a lot. During college, she met a guy who she was attracted to. So he was like this real hip and slick guy, and he had these cool cars and dressed great. He was really extremely handsome, and he was funny, and, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he just was, he, to me, he was cool. And I remember that um, he said that he wouldn't use a condom. And I said, have you had any behaviors that would, and I said, I don't, I don't mean to put you down. He goes, I love you, and I, you, know, you can trust me. She says she didn't listen to her inner voice because she was high on liquor. And later on, she made an awful discovery. Ew, he's an addict. Ugh, get out of my life, you know? Four years later, Kimberly ran the New York Marathon, then decided to donate blood that same week. She was feeling great. And then I got a letter in the mail, and it says, um, you know, that they can't accept my blood for donation, that I need to call them immediately to come down and find out why. And I was like, boom, you know, crying when I was having sex with Steve. Um, it was just like, I just remembered that totally. Like, it was, that whole scenario just played back. And the whole way driving there to the Red Cross, I was just like banging on the steering wheel. I'm like, no, this can't be for real, this can't be for real. I went down to the Red Cross and I said, you know, what's going on? And, and she said, um, you, um, you need to sit down. And I said, I don't want to sit down. Just tell me what's going on. And she said, you just need to sit down. And I wouldn't sit down. And she said, Kimberly, you're HIV positive. And I totally fainted. Over the next two years, Kimberly spiraled downward into a life of hell. Her self-esteem hit a low, and she got heavy into drugs. Basically, my disease was so on my back that I had to go get high. Okay, you can jump off that bridge, but go get high first. You know, just it was just like it was on my back because I hated I hated cocaine, smoking cocaine. I hated it. Feeling hopeless and helpless, Kimberly lived in abandoned houses. All of a sudden, I am homeless, and I am. The only time I can have a place to sleep or eat is if I decide to come into um, recovery because nobody else, nobody will help me unless I'm, and I was not feeling like I wanted to live. So I wanted to stay out there until I died. Kimberly has a friend, Jamie Paula, who has supported her throughout her ups and downs. I'm drawn to her for her love of life, her passion for living, uh, but she also had a dark side. She'd go in and out of my life for a year. And she'd go on the streets for a couple weeks and then come back in and then go on the street. And I wanted to find her. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I wanted to help her. And the only time I ate or slept was if I went to a recovery house or a treatment center or a detox. And um, I, I went to many. I went to probably 15 recovery houses and 14 or 15 treatment centers in, in five years. And I mean, it was just, it was, it was a tough road. It was not good. I think in order for her to get better, we all had to let go of her and let her go through her own process. Then one day, not so long ago, things turned for Kimberly. An inner spark burst into flame. And I just said, I want to live. That was the first time in my life I said, I want to live. And, I, and I've been striving towards that ever since. And that's a hard thing for me, because my, my, I want to cry, because my, my normal pattern is just one to self-destruct. She has learned to speak openly about being HIV positive, even though it's not easy. I think the best thing I've done is just not to keep it a secret. And I've gotten, to, and, it, and I talk about it. And keep it, keeping a secret would make me feel shame. And I feel shame anyway, even when I'm talking about it, but it makes it less. Um, it's much better to, to let it out and, um, and to let people know um, who, what happened to me. With Jamie's urging, Kimberly started dating. In a dating situation, it's very uncomfortable for her when she first meets a man. Um, she feels like she's misleading people 
And uh, so there is a stigma, particularly when you're a young single woman uh, looking, looking to date. But Kimberly managed to muster the courage to tell a boyfriend. And we worked through a relationship for like a year and a half, two, almost two years. Um, we started dating. Um, he went to my doctor's visits with me. And um, he learned about HIV with me. So I was very lucky. Jamie and some friends chipped in and bought Kimberly a motorcycle, some positive reinforcement for a woman who has taken control of her life. Kimberly's self-esteem has returned, but that doesn't mean that the personal pain has gone. The pain I have today is so empowering. The pain I had before was so confusing and so mind-boggling and wanting to die and I didn't understand why I felt the way I felt, why I was having these feelings. And today I can, ha I can go through painful situations and go through them and feel the pain and, and walk through the pain and, 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 know, and be better for it. And, and that empowers me. In Baltimore, homosexual sex accounts for 12% of HIV transmissions. Many African American men will hide their homosexual behavior, preferring to live on the down low. Keith is upfront and honest about being gay. Keith Barmer was only 14 years old when he was raped by his uncle. Two years later, he inadvertently discovered that he was HIV positive. It was 1989, had a girlfriend. I was, you know, doing things that I shouldn't have been doing, um, experimenting with drugs like marijuana and alcohol. And um, my mom, she found out about it, so she sent me to an adolescent treatment facility. And um, it was at that time that I discovered that um, I was infected with HIV. It was difficult. It was unbelievable. It was um, unbearable. I was thinking and feeling that um, I didn't want to die from HIV or AIDS. And um, so I wanted to, to kill myself. I became angry at God because I felt like I was being punished. I felt like I was being suffered. Mentally and emotionally, I started to deteriorate. You know, spiritually, I was already gone. My first time experimenting with Herman and cocaine, I shot it. You know, um, because again, nothing mattered. You know, school didn't matter. You know, the track team didn't matter. ROTC didn't matter. Acting didn't matter. Nothing mattered. And I still couldn't accept the fact that, okay, I was HIV positive. I wouldn't go to the doctors. I wouldn't talk about it. It didn't even exist. Somehow I had blocked it out. And it was easier for me to cope that way. So my behavior was as though it didn't exist as well. So, you know, I was having sex as if it didn't exist. You know, I'm having, you know, unprotected sex. Men. Um, clubs male prostitute in areas. Um, you know, there's a, 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 a section you know, in the city called the Meat Rat. You know, and that's a, um, a, a known, well-known male prostitute in area. And um, at that time, you know, I was using drugs, so I had to find ways and means to support my habit. And that became an easy way for me to support my habit. The turning point was 
having done everything to try to destroy myself and try to destroy my life. Every way that I know or knew possible to destroy myself and was never successful. And I decided that I wasn't gonna keep trying to kill myself, but I was gonna try to learn how to live. So I had to make a decision. And with that decision, I had to accept the fact that I was HIV positive. And once I was able to do that, then I was able to work on other areas of my life. Because once I accepted the fact that I was HIV positive, then I wasn't so depressed. And when I wasn't so depressed, I didn't feel a need to use drugs. You know, um, things started to matter to me again. The the biggest challenge for me was not only accepting it, but accepting it and knowing that accepting it doesn't mean that I'm being defeated. So I had to accept it in order to win. And, and accepting it means, okay, going to the doctors, keeping appointments, you know, um, practicing a, a healthy, you know, lifestyle, sexually, mentally, you know, emotionally, you know, um, doing things that don't put myself at risk or other people at risk, being educated to the point where so not only can I prevent myself from being reinfected, but I can go out and I can prevent others by educating them as well. And that to me is defeating the disease. Before anything, I'm a human being. Secondly, I'm a male. Then after that comes all my wonderful personalities. I'm caring, you know, I'm patient, I'm supportive, I'm generous. I'm thoughtful, I'm passionate, you know, I'm creative. All of those things come before HIV come. That's the last thing on the list for me. I'm so much more than that. Rakina, Kimberly, David, and Keith have chosen to speak out to encourage others who practice risky behavior to get tested and to make positive choices. With the right support, treatment, and perseverance, they are living proof that it is possible to live a rewarding and productive life. Let their positive voices be an inspiration to us all.